Good evening, and thank you so much, Pastor Gary. You know, I, I really want to commend Pastor. Uh, we're discussing a subject with many echoes to accompany it that not a lot of people, especially pastors, want to deal with. The subject of deception and the occult in the church, and it's a subject generally guaranteed to make the person dealing with it about as popular as an aardvark at an ant convention. So I really want to thank the pastor for having the courage, because it takes courage. But you know, to ignore the subject of deception and the occult in the, and prophecy in the church today is to ignore a vast portion of scripture, including the warnings of Jesus Christ himself on the subject. I hope you brought your Bibles with you. Open them up, bring them out, keep them in your hand. That is the sword of the spirit against which you test every teaching, every sign, every healing, every wonder, every prophecy, every wo my words, Carol's words, Warren Smith's words, Ray Youngen's words, even Pastor Gary's words. You test it against that Bible. If they don't match, guess which one you get to dump, okay? <laughs> Matthew chapter 24. Jesus was asked, Lord, what is the sign of the end of the age and of your coming? And most of us are familiar with the passage where Jesus was talking about, watch out, there will be wars and rumors of wars, and plagues, and famines, and earthquakes, and treachery, and persecution, and the, the slaughter of the people of God on an unprecedented scale. We're all familiar with those signs. They've been here for 2,000 years. They've been here since the beginning of time. What Jesus was talking about was, as his approach comes, you will be seeing these signs increase in intensity and in frequency. And he said, however, the first sign before he gets into all these others is in verse 4. See to it that no one mislead you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will what? Mislead many. The first sign Jesus Christ mentions, Lord, what are the signs of the end of the age in your coming? Is watch out, heads up, spiritual deception. People of God, you see to it. No one misleads you. Christians who think, I'm a Christian, I'm sincere, I can't be deceived, ha! Dream on, because the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, you pay attention and see to it no one mislead you. Then he goes down and in verse 11 he says, and false prophets will arise and will what? Mislead many. Not only will you have false Christ standing up saying, I am Messiah, I am the avatar, I am the guru, I am the way, I am the you will also have false prophets, those men and women standing up saying, Thus saith the Lord, listen to me. And they will have signs and wonders to prove it. How do I know? Jesus tells me. In case you didn't get it the first two times, mislead you, verse 4, mislead you, verse 11. He tells you again in verse 24 and 25, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will do what? Show great signs and wonders so as to mislead were it possible. How can it be that people of God who should know the word and be testing all of these things against the word, even the children of God will be misled? See to it, no one mislead you. And then he says, if you do not pay attention, you are running a great risk of massive deception. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Look, the world is being groomed for the arrival of one whom scripture refers to as the Antichrist, the one who is coming, presenting himself instead of Christ. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, turn to that, because it's worth taking a moment to look at it. It sets the foundation for why we're seeing the massive increase and in influx of occultism in the last 100, and especially in the last 50, 60 years. In 2 Thessalonians, Chapter 2, now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, children of God. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, 
the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God displaying himself as being God. Back when I was growing up, anybody who claimed they were God would have been locked up next to the guy who thought he was a poached egg. But then after Shirley MacLaine standing tentatively at first by the shores of the Pacific Ocean, I am God. I am God, I am God. Now if you don't think you're God, they look at you askew and think there's something really wrong with you. How is it you don't understand your personal divinity? After all, Jesus Christ came to show us not how divine he was, but how divine you are, says Oprah Winfrey, adored and followed by countless millions around the world. Then he talks about the mystery of lawlessness in verse seven, and only he who now restrains it will do so until he's taken out of the way. But now look here in verse nine, he's talking about then that lawless one in verse 10 will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, not lying in the sense of legere de main, like a skilled magician, like the amazing Randy, who can duplicate and mimic many of the so-called miracles that are purely fraudulent, he's saying this man is coming with genuine power, but not from God. And if you do not find yourself alert to that, you may be among those who find themselves in the middle of all that deception of verse 10 of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Now pay attention to this next verse, people, for this reason. Because the people who should have known better did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they may believe what is false in order that they may all be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. The Antichrist is coming with genuine power but not from God. Genuine satanic power to deceive the elect and we have seen the rise of the occult why to condition and prepare the people of the world to accept the 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 miraculous powers that the antichrist is coming and so we see psychic phenomena for decades some of us have been collecting articles here i mean Things like the superstitions, which actually is the foundational form of occultism and magic. Any triskaidekaphobics here? Why Friday the 13th scares people silly. There are people who did not come tonight. I will bet you any amount of money you want because they were scared to death. Friday the 13th is a day of bad luck. And there are places in Japan, for example, they skip floors. Floor 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, like bad luck can't count. Give me a break, you know, these stupidities. But for years I've been gathering articles. One, for example, from the bastion of American journalism, the National Enquirer, back in 1978. In the poll of the most intelligent, 69% believe in ESP, telepathy, and clairvoyance. And it's talking about how Mensa, which of course I'm always rather fond of observing that in slang Spanish, Mensa means really dumb and stupid. Oh, I belong to Mensa. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> yeah, here you've got 69%, and I'm not going to waste our time. I wish we had several hours. These statistics are hysterical, and they kind of make you nostalgic for the good old days when the, about the worst thing we had to deal with, it seemed, back in the old hippie. Any of you old hippies around here? Pastor, you might remember. You ever encounter the crystal-powered pants? Carol, I'll bet you did. The Chi pants, these are crystal powered pants that they were advertising. Oh, they were so cool, I almost bought a pair. We are now offering what we believe are the world's very first crystal powered pants. We sew a very small perfect crystal in the back seam of your pant right above the base of the spine to do what? To raise what Carol was brilliantly illustrating in her previous lecture a few minutes ago. To raise and rouse the Kundalini serpent power, this mythical, mystical occult force that is viewed by the Hindus as residing as a serpent coiled at the base of the spine so that it can alert and awaken and rise up the kundalini serpent power to awaken the chakras and culminate in that experience of one with divinity that I am one with God 
Oh, for the days of crystal-powered pants. Now we're dealing with a lot more serious things. Alternative thought affects thousands, and how it's taking root in, mis in uh, the society today, how more report mystical experiences than ever before, mysticism going mainstream. Today, a recent Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life reported in USA Today, and this was in 2009, that two in three adults believe in or have had an experience with at least one supernatural phenomenon. People, if that doesn't startle you and shock you, it should. Two in three adults, and that's just the adults. How many of you understand that the little ones, the kids who are being left to be babysat by the cartoons that are filling them with basic kindergarten level information on mysticism and the occult and witchcraft, I included some information on that in my second book, like lambs to the slaughter, your child in the occult. About 65% of those surveyed in this Pew Forum on Religion also expressed belief in or report having had an experience with a variety of supernatural phenomena, such as believing in astrology as being an important factor for making decisions. How many of you consulted your horoscope before deciding to come here tonight? I spoke at one Baptist woman's retreat. There were a hundred women there. When I asked that question at the end of a couple of days of teaching about what is the occult, what is deception, how is it coming in the church, what does the Bible have to say about it, do you know that virtually every single woman in that Baptist woman's study, except two, the pastor's wife and the worship leader, and they came to me privately afterwards. Belief in astrology or being in touch with the dead, you think that isn't a big deal today? Being in touch with the dead, any of you watch Heaven is for Real? Any of you reading the articles in the Christian magazines about the near-death experiences and moving in through portals and into heaven and talking to the dead? No apostolic reformation is filled with that. We'll touch on that, I think, between tonight and tomorrow, I'm sure. Or consulting a psychic. It's a multi-billion dollar business in some areas, especially by Wall Street. You want to know why the market goes up and down? Those idiots sitting in Wall Street are consulting the psychics about what the market says and where to go with it. No wonder we're in a mess. The number of Americans who said they interact with ghosts has doubled over the last 13 years. We don't have time to look at these statistics, but look, people, the fact is the occult isn't just out there with them pagans those ignoramuses out there getting involved in all these occult things out there. People, it's entrenched in the church. There are Christians, many, maybe even sitting here, who themselves have either in, been involved in this, had experiences with it, played around with it as a kid, inherited it, maybe down through the family line. You've got family members who've been involved in spiritism or santeria or witchcraft or voodoo or, or tarot cards or, or worship of Mary, worship of saints, all kinds of occult things that can come down even in the church because of the ignorance and the lack of discernment of the church because pastors will not teach on the subject. 80% of the kids in the church, Christian youth say they have never been taught anything about the paranormal or the occult. And then we wonder why they show up at Halloween parties, the celebration of the great Celtic New Year and the worship and idolatry and the celebration of every form of occultism, witchcraft, superstition, the dead, and, and everything dark that God has called abomination, which I hope we'll have time to get into tonight. If not, I will deal with it or at least touch on it tomorrow evening when we conclude, when we talk about how do you test the spirits? How do you find out what's the difference between fleece and fur, the wolf and the sheep? It's in the church with Harry Potter, with the Twilight series that they just rerun. All of these mystical things, do you, parents, do you have any idea what your kids are into? It is scary. Look, in the Berean call, may God rest Dave Hunt's soul a true prophet of the Lord in many ways who sought and paid a dear price for trying to alert the church to these things and was pilloried for his trouble, called a hater and a Pharisee and a divider of the brethren. We'll touch on that later and see who the divider of the brethren really are. He said, it, well, actually, the, the Berean Call staff said in an article in 2006, a call to repentance. He says, quote, more than 90% of Americans claim to believe in God and about 80% call themselves Christians. Guys, just because a Mercedes Benz is sitting in your garage, right, doesn't mean it's yours necessarily, and doesn't mean it's worth driving. 
They fall apart a lot. But when asked to define God, the answers range from Mother Earth to a higher power. And many who claim to be born again deny that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. About 70% of Americans, 64% who call themselves born again, and mind you, this was in 2006, and 40% of self-proclaimed evangelicals reject the idea of absolute truth. And most of those who claim to believe in absolutes have fallen victim to a universal reluctance to speak the truth. Political correctness has entrenched itself even in the church, which, by the way, political correctness originated with the Soviet Union. It is not politically correct to speak against the state and anything we decree to be truth. What the heck is it doing in our society? And what's it doing in the church? where people will not speak the truth because they don't want to offend anybody, they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, they don't want to open a can of worms. 1 Timothy 4.1, Pastor Gary properly opened with it, the Spirit, not Paul, not his opinion, not G. I think, the Holy Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some shall fall away from the faith. Doing what? Giving heed to seducing, lying spirits, and doctrines of demons, not doctrines about demons, but doctrines taught by demons. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, 14, and 15. For Satan disguises himself as what? An angel of light. So why are you surprised that his servants disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their deeds? But still, the whole concept of the beautiful side of evil eludes us. I had people, when I first wrote, my first book, The Beautiful Side of Evil, it's available on Amazon, it's out of print. There's none here, I'm terribly sorry about that. And by the way, don't blame me for whatever they're charging on Amazon, it's not my fault. But when that book first came out, I had people calling me up, what do you mean the beautiful side of evil? There ain't no such thing as the beautiful side of evil. Why don't you call it the beautiful side of trials and tribulations? And I'm thinking, ay vey, you don't understand. There is a form of occultism that is blatant and clear and in your face, but there's another form that's like Satan coming disguised as an angel of light. So why are you surprised if his ministers, his servants, some even in pulpits of the biggest churches in the world, are proclaiming to you doctrines taught by devils? For, let, me give, let me give you an example of that. A number of years ago, December 1st, 2008, I know, Carol, you'll remember this, there was a terrorist attack at the Taj Mahal Hotel in Mumbai, India, and a couple was being interviewed. 180 people were slaughtered by these terrorists in the name of their God. Murdered innocent people. I'm sure their God was very proud of them. And these people, Ben and Carla Makoff, were being interviewed, and listen to what they said, because it's applicable to the entire subject of this weekend. They said, these kids, they didn't have the mustache. They didn't look evil. They looked like young men, probably in their late teens, early 20s, slim, athletic looking, talking to each other. One was talking to, 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 on a cell phone. And then he knocks on their door. They were going up and down the hallways, ringing the doorbells and knocking on the doors of the people in the hotel room. And the minute they opened the door, bam, they killed them in the name of their God. And these people knew, they saw what was going on and they hid down and he peeked out and he could see this happening. And he said, you know, the face of evil doesn't, isn't necessarily evil looking. Are you getting that? If you're sitting there expecting the bad guys to wear the black hats and the good guys to wear the white hats or wear an obligingly sinister sneer like most of Congress, a good part of the Senate, and not to mention the White House. You're going to be deceived and deluded. E the face of evil isn't necessarily evil looking. The same assumption is made on a spiritual level. Evil, we think, in the church will always give me a creepy feeling. But if I feel a wonderful feeling, if it's of the Lord, hallelujah, I get a burning in my bosom, take a Maalox. Your job isn't to sit there and say, is Benny Hinn of the Lord? Look at all the people who come and say, what is he doing according to the word of God? If we're assuming evil is immediately recognizable, we'll make our flesh crawl, we'll do overtly evil things, and if it doesn't, then it must be good. Then we're saying, well, gee, if it looks holy, 
does good, wears a crucifix, recites the Lord's Prayer, carries the Bible, uses the name of Jesus, gives us a wonderful, here's a key word, people, experience. Oh, it feels so holy. It feels so right. It can't be wrong if it feels so right. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> Want a bet? It must be from God, and I will tell you, my story is one of understanding. I can make fun of this kind of deception because I have sort of gotten myself the t-shirt on the been there, done that routine. I know what it's like to experience spiritual evil and to feel the creepy crawlies going up my leg, not like the thrill that Chris Matthew gets when he listens to what's in the White House. I know what it's like to feel that terror in the middle of the night when I'm a little girl helpless and the faces and the... Some of you have felt that, you know what I'm talking about. But for 14 months, from 1971 to September of 1972, I worked with a woman in Mexico City who had genuine spiritual power. Her name was Pachita. She's written about extensively now on the internet. Books have been written about her and some of the top psychic researchers in the world have not only, or did not only, back before she died, have operations themselves, but investigated her pretty thoroughly and said she is one of the most astonishing, genuine psychic surgeons, shamans in the world. There are many frauds. Most of them are. But the existence of a counterfeit presupposes the existence of the original. Otherwise, the counterfeit is meaningless. A counterfeit $100 bill means nothing if there isn't a real one out there somewhere, right? There is a genuine individual out there somewhere, people who know and have been able to tap into genuine psychic occult, according to scripture, demonic power and do astonishing things. When I first met Pachita, she identified me as a medium. She lived in the slums of Mexico City in... a place across from a stench of a market. She had for 40 years been doing things that had gained her fame across the world. People crowding in to see and consult with the spirit who claimed that he came and worked through her. A spirit that called himself Hermanito, little brother, and claimed that he was the spirit of Cuauhtémoc's uh, uh, Cuauhtémoc, who had been un untimely killed by the Spanish in uh, in conquistadores in uh, 15, 19, 15, 20, 15, 21, and was coming back to work through Pachita to fulfill his karma. And he did incredible things through her. I walk into this little room, a, a, a courtyard crowded with people, some dressed in rags, others elegantly garbed, all of them coming for a final hope to consult with the spirit who claimed to be from God, claimed to be all-knowing, claimed to be all-powerful. And I walk into this little room, her, her spirit guide, her falcon, Bob Jones had a, an eagle that came to him, swift eagle. The, the shamans all know you have to have a spirit. You, you know in your airport, here when you come into your beautiful airport, there's this beautiful carving of a shaman with his eagle going on a vision quest. Most shamans know they need to have a power animal for their vision quest. Pachita had a falcon, and I walked into this little room lit by a single naked light bulb, and there was bottles of smelly alcohol, and there was an altar in the corner with musty dead roses in some vases. There were weird things on this altar, all bound up in dark cloth and strings and cascabeles. How do you say cascabeles in English? These rattles that were placed over it. There was a rusty hunting knife on the altar. There were... There were people milling about. There was a statue of Cuauhtémoc on the altar. Uh, there's a big, full, huge, monstrous size in Mexico City of Cuauhtémoc, a great hero of the Mexican people. And there was a miniature of this on the altar standing next to a crucifix and a picture of Jesus. And then I see this old woman we got there too late the first night I arrived to see the operations, but there's an old woman sitting on a cot with dried blood crusted up to her forearms, puffing on a cigarette, talking to one of the leaders of the mind control group that had brought me. I'll tell you about that in a moment. 
And she asked me if I were a medium, and I said, I don't know, Pachita, sometimes I think so, because the feeling in this place was so different. I'd spent years in terror, in horror, knowing the existence of the spiritual was there, and knowing there were evil beings there, and being absolutely powerless to do anything about it. But now, I walk into this place where miracles purportedly take place, and the feeling, the sense, the vibration, the atmosphere was so different from anything else I'd encountered. And there's this old woman who's glaring at me intently and asking me if I were a medium. And then she instructs me, come back. And I'm told that I've been selected to be one of her personal assistants, a great honor. And so I start going to Pachitas and I assist over the 14 months I worked with her in over 200 operations and witnessed over 200 others. And people, can I prove it to you? No, I cannot. I can only tell you that I stood there and watched Hermanito peel a cataract off a woman's eye, the first surgery I ever witnessed and assisted in. A woman who was, and back in 1971, cataract surgery was considerably more frightening, especially in Mexico, than it was uh, or is today. And she was terrified, and Hermanito said, fine, he sits her down, he takes the knife, he begins to peel away, and I'm standing this close to the woman's face. He takes a bottle of unopened alcohol, pours it in the woman's eye, peels it off, puts a cotton over it, bandages her up. A week later, she comes back, the cataract is gone, the doctor can't figure out where his surgery patient and the fee that went with it vanished to. The cataract was gone. I assisted in the surgery of a man who came from, from California, part of the Mormon temple. And he stretched out, and people, I know what you're about to hear is medically impossible. No, I have not lost my mind. There was a medical surgeon who often attended these surgeries and helped assist in some of these things with his own surgical practice in Mexico City. And I assisted in a surgery in which this man has his back sliced open my hands are on either side of the wound with nothing more than a rusty hunting knife and a pair of scissors and a bottle of unopened alcohol. It's the one concession to antiseptics, enough to make any doctor, nurse, or nurse practitioner in this place run shrieking from the premises, and I don't blame you. I'd have been right behind you if I hadn't had my hands in it. And Hermanito takes a vertebra out of no sleeves, no, no fake thumbs with betel nut juice, takes a, a vertebra that had been collected from the cadavers uh, at the morgue, at the city morgue that morning, and he removes this vertebra. Yes, I know it's medically impossible. And he places another one in, and I've got my hands on either side of this man's spot, like this, with the vertebra being hammered in. Yes, he can feel it. Yes, he's feeling pain. No, not too bad. The blood pouring over my hands. A word spoken, the blood stops. A tumor removed, and a stench filling the place. No. No sleeves, no jars. I helped set up this operation myself, people. And the man is healed, blood on his pajamas later that night. We change his pajamas. That tumor and the pain in his back were gone. I can't explain it medically. What about the man who had an inoperable brain tumor that I saw and assisted when this tumor was, the skull was split open and in the middle of removing the stench of a tumor from the man's skull, yes, I know it's impossible. Hermanito reaches in and as I'm looking at this man's face, suddenly his eyes are totally crossed and Hermanito says, little daughter, look at this man's eyes, are he, is he okay? I said, well, are, are you okay? He says, no, I feel really dizzy. This is really weird. I can feel this thing inside my skull. And Hermanito, I said, no, his eyes are totally crossed. Well, that won't do, will it? And he sticks his hand back in the man's skull, fiddles around, and I watched as this man's eyes strained back up again. A year later, when I went back and I did some research and I tried to track down some of these people with, with whom I'd interacted during these surgeries, that's, that tumor was gone. A, a, a boy born to, a, hundreds of these operations, there is genuine power involved there. Gold dust that was manifested, she would have fit right into a lot of the new apostolic reformation sessions. A man named Andriy Zhabuharic, he died in 1995. This man had a medical degree from Northwestern University with a specialty in bioengineering, held more than 60 US and foreign patents. And by the way, it's worth noting 
that Dr. Buharic was the very first U.S. military intelligent research and development programmer on psychic phenomena, PK, and mind control that were being conducted by the army, etc. This man was a brilliant genius and a researcher. In January of 1978, and I have his own testimony, he went to research Pachita, and he gives a testimony on how she took a knife, jammed it in his ears, dug around, and removed an autosclerosis, a spongy bone growth from both ears that was causing progressive hearing loss. And his testimony, the testimony of this man with 60 patents, and one of the first developers of the super soldiers and the, the, the great military psychic warriors and warrior monks in the United States Army, they were doing that in Russia and China as well, had his own surgery and his testimony was one month after my operation was complete, my hearing was totally back to normal. And he said, this woman was genuine, couldn't explain it. I met this woman through a group called Silva Mind Control. It, it was rapidly changed to the Silva method. They figured out mind control wasn't such a cool thing. It's one of hundreds of throwbacks to the new age descendants of Eastern mysticism that advocate finding one's inner God. It was started by a man named Jose Silva and who cares? We're not gonna take our time looking into that right now. But it's one of those 48 hour self-help programs that help you tap into your inner God, your latent genius potential. They would teach you using techniques of auto-hypnosis and first level induction techniques, meditation, Eastern meditation techniques, guided imagery visualization techniques. They were basically teaching you how to alter your state of consciousness, how to tap into the alpha brainwave frequency, which can be measured by an electroencephalograph, and teach you how to tap into that at will. Basically, they were teaching you in 48 simple short hours for a very small fee, how to become a psychic, a guru, a medium, an occultist, a shaman, in a short period of time, and it was astonishing. When I first encountered Silva Mind Control, I had just graduated from college with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in theater, couldn't act my way out of a paper sack, don't tell anybody, I still got out of college with my degree. Went back to Mexico, and Papa said, you're looking bored stiff, why don't you go check out this Mind Control people, and that's how I met them. For the first time in my life, I now began to find out how I could control and harness the forces that were surrounding me and deal with all of the terror that was dealing with me at will. I was learning how to develop the psychic abilities that I had from the time I was a little girl. And they said, look, the proof that you're gonna be working at this genius potential level is that you are going to be doing the same kinds of things that Edgar Cayce did. You guys familiar with Edgar Cayce? He was one of the most famous, some of you are, one of the most famous psychics of the 20th century. From the time he was a young, he would find himself irresistibly falling into a sleep. It was a trance state and these voices would begin speaking through him. He tried to fight it for a long time. He was a good Methodist, read the Bible once a year, every year for like 47 years or something like that. He knew the Bible, he said, if ever the devil was to pull a fast trick on me, this would be it. But he'd find himself going into a trance state and in this unconscious state would be given the name, age, location of an individual anywhere in the world. And the voice is speaking, yes, we have the body before us, would speak exact, direct, unbelievably accurate information about what this individual needed and exactly where to find the obscure medicine. Yes, in this little pharmacy on the second shelf behind the third bottle under the second, th which got lost back in 1982. Uh, you know, you, you have this thing there and that is what's going to help this person. We were being taught to do exactly the same thing Edgar Casey did, but on a conscious level. And Dion Fortune made a very astute observation. Shifting consciousness is the key to all occult training. But look, the point of this is here. Using the techniques of guided imagery visualization, techniques that are used in the inner healing movement, techniques of hypnosis and positive confession that we see in the word faith movement, occult meditation techniques that are identical to the techniques used by the inner healing movement and the contemplative prayer movement and the breath movement, we were being trained to be psychics and shamans. And they said, look, one of the key things to your evolving and your development into this genius potential is you need counselors, two counselors. And I said, I don't want two counselors. I only want one counselor. You've got to have two counselors, a male and a female. 
And they explained to us that these counselors were essential for the work we were going to be called to do. They said these counselors, however, are unpredictable. They said one rabbi who went through the Silva method asked for uh, Moses and Rebecca, and I think he got a pharaoh and some belly dancer. And he was horrified by it, but there was nothing he could do. They were his counselors and they came. What counselor could I have? People, I was a Christian. I loved the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, there's only one counselor I want, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. After all, Jesus didn't, didn't he say, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come in and sup with him. I said, I want Jesus. So using techniques that were also being taught by John Wimber, I was there at the vineyard Anaheim where they were teaching the young pastors and the people coming to the, the, the seminar sessions of Okay, take a deep breath, breathe in, breathe out. Now we're going to go using the, the metronome and the auto-hypnotic uh, techniques, first level induction. We're going to take deep breaths like the breath prayers, breathe in, breathe out. We're going to count ourselves down to a special place of silence. After all, doesn't the word say, be still and know that you are God? Don't you know that's how many of these people have now retranslated uh, Psalm 46, be still and know that you are God. And so now in this place of stillness, we created a special psychic laboratory, a special place. Mine was filled with crystals and shimmering light. And in this place, I see Jesus coming down, being brought down through these techniques. And it was Jesus. And I stood and fell at his feet. But then I said, maybe I got the wrong one. And I go back and I try it again and I bring down through the same techniques and now he's doing weird things. I prayed and I said, Lord, show me, is this really the counselor I'm supposed to have or am I supposed to have a belly dancer and some Pharaoh? This Jesus then started doing weird things. He came down again. I was alone in my room at night. No one was awake. It was in the middle of the night and this horrible twisted, contorted face of a werewolf shows up and I'm terrified and I can't count out. Any of you who've traveled out, out of body experiences and been caught in this realm, like Robert Monroe and others have been, know the reality of this psychic realm that we're being led into by many in the New Apostolic Reformation and many in the occult. And in this spot, I, I'm seeing the werewolf face and Sarah Bernhardt, all right, I had to have two counselors, I figured I could use tips on acting. And she's showing up, werewolf face, Sarah Bernhardt, Jesus, werewolf. And I said, Lord, why are you doing this? It frightens me. And Jesus said, oh, my child, it's just that you're not evolved enough. When you come to grow and understand who you really are, then you will see us as we really are. Look, people, I was a true believer. I loved the Lord Jesus Christ. But I didn't know that Satan comes disguised as an angel of light. I didn't know some of the passages that we're still going to take a moment to look at, even though I'm running out of time, about another Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. I thought this had to be the real Jesus. After all, like Richard Foster says in Celebration of Discipline, any of you familiar with that book? The first edition of that book, I've got one with me if you want to see it, 1978 edition. He said, look, you can actually encounter the real Jesus using these techniques of guided imagery visualization, that he helped bring into the church that comes straight out of the occult and shamanism that I was taught by the medium Pachita and by the psychics and in Silva mind control. He said this on page 26 of Celebration of Discipline, hence you can actually encounter the living Christ in the event and be addressed by his voice and be touched by his healing power. It can be more than an exercise of the imagination. It can be a genuine confrontation. Jesus Christ will actually come to you. People like sweet Sarah Young, whom I'm sure is one of the sincerest, most genuine people on the face of the earth. I have no reason to question her sincerity. Who has this encounter at Labrie, which is where I wound up, interestingly, beginning to get out of the occult. She finds herself encountering a Jesus who says, I am Jesus and I'm now going to give you these wonderful new revelations. And I wonder, as I look at these revelations that claim to be from Jesus, and as I compare them to the word of God, what Jesus is she talking about? Because he sure sounds like the Jesus in my psychic laboratory, not like the Jesus I found out is in the Bible. But the experiences are glorious and mystical. 
And I, like Sarah Young, I learned to visualize this golden white light of protection all about me. I was practicing and teaching yoga, hatha yoga and raja yoga, and sure that because it was feeling so peaceful and so centered, it had to be from God. Nothing could have been further from the truth. I was now a firm adherent in the belief in reincarnation and having over 15 different memories of incarnations, and my experience told me all this was of God. But back in those days, there was someone in my life who kept doing the most being blasted annoying things she kept asking questions how do you know yes you're having all these wonderful mystical experiences how do you know it's from God how do you know and I came up with all these smooth slick explanations but the truth was I didn't have a clue how I knew this was from God except that my experience felt that way and please make a note of it all this time I was a Christian I'd accepted the Lord my freshman year in college I understood the Roman way, Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I understood Romans 6.23, that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I knew Romans 5.8, that God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I knew Romans 10, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. I was a true born again believer, people, when I got involved in silver mind control, when I became more psychic than I had ever been in my youth, when I got involved in belief in reincarnation and yoga, when I got involved in working with a psychic and a medium and doing the best I could to become a full trans medium and channeler, I was a true Christian. The problem was I was ignorant as the day was long and dumb as a stick. The fact is most people in the church have all the discernment of your average pogo stick. They wouldn't know a counterfeit or if it ran them over in the street. That's what I said to Edith Schaefer, the wife of Dr. Francis Schaefer, one of the great theologians of the 20th century, who, when I met her, I was, went to listen to Dr. Schaefer, and she was saying to me, Johanna, I'm a little uncomfortable about these experiences. And I'm saying, Dr. Dr. Schaefer simply doesn't understand. And Mrs. Schaefer, I'm sorry to say this, but you're a narrow-minded, Bible-thumping, fundamentalist, evangelical bigot. not arrogant on this end of the scale. She kind of paled in the Acapulco sun and said nothing. But some time later, when I reached a point of saying, you know what, I don't know the answers to this. Somewhere, there's got to be a source of absolute truth against which I can compare my experience. If there is no source of absolute truth in any occultist down, you sit there and you say, I know he lives, he lives within my heart, and you're sitting there sharing your experiences, I guarantee you most occultists will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you on experiences all day long. You are not going to convince a hardcore, especially Christianized occultist, that your experience is proof of a living God. What does the word say? And the fact is, the Bible flatly contradicts every single tenet and point of the occult and the New Age. Why do you think there's such an attack against the inerrancy of Scripture? Bible bashers get in line, and let me tell you, the worst attacks against Scripture isn't from the ACLU or the Atheist Society that wants to take down crosses, it's from the so-called evangelicals. I wish we had time. I'm running out of time, so I'm synthesizing here real fast, but I wish we had time to talk about the Eugene Petersons, and they're blasphemous. There is no other word for it. Parody, invention that he calls a translation of the word of God with more occult subtleties and twistings and manipulations turning the word of God into a social gospel and a new age apologetic. Richard Foster's Renovare Bible. It should make us blush. Some of the biggest names in Christendom have endorsed that, that piece of trash that masquerades as a Bible that Rick Warren touts and quotes everywhere. Oh, it so ministers to my heart. Well, yeah, mostly because your heart doesn't know the Word of God. I mean, the Chicken Soup for the Soul Bible, the Renovare Bible that, that questions the divine inspiration, the Queen James Bible, you encounter that one recently? The Green Bible, the Passion Translation, the Religion Free Bible, try that one on for size. I mean, it's like, it's like the Bible, you, you know that old hymn, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word? They might as well be singing the praises of a Playtex girdle when they sing about how firm a foundation, because they ain't singing about this. 
You know, it's like, it's like Elizabeth Swan in the Pirates of the Caribbean. Remember when she said, hang the code, it's just guidelines anyway, right? And all through the theme of the first Pirates movie, it's, well, hang the code, they're just guidelines anyway, until she made the mistake of saying it in front of the keeper of the code. And he pulls out his pistol and he's about to blow away and all of a sudden it was, we like the code, nothing wrong with the code, everything, yes, the code of Bartholomew. The scriptures are the writings of God bearing the divine stamp and imprimatur, those who dare treat them with levity. Who dares treat them with levity? He who despises them despises the God who wrote them, says Charles Spurgeon, and on that one he was right. I wound up redefining Jesus to suit my experience. I started out with the Jesus of the Bible. I wound up with God, Jesus, the greatest guru, the greatest medium of the seventh sphere, wherever that was, I never did figure it out. The greatest prophet, the greatest teacher, the great... Finally, I wind up in Labri, and I find myself with Os Guinness, who was then working on his first book, The Dust of Death, and with Sheila Bird, one of the counselors there, and they said, Johanna, Read the Gospel of John, read the first epistle of John. And for the first time, this little question hit my brain like a little earworm that kept going round and round. What if I'm wrong? And I prayed, God, if I'm wrong about Pachita, about yoga, about my experiences, about these mystical wonders, these incredible things that so feel like they're from you. Oh, God, if I'm wrong about this, show me. Do not pray that prayer unless you mean it. God pulled back the veil. He let me have a face-to-face -face encounter on the side of a mountain in Switzerland where these demons tried to kill me for the first time in 14 months since I'd been working with mind control and Pachita. These demons came back in a rush and I tried to call on Jesus, the Jesus in my psychic laboratory, Jesus, Jesus help me as I was running blindly in this pitch black darkness and I feel this fish slam out of the, 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 the metaphysical dark and smash me between my shoulder blades and I fall forward calling on the name and I'm hearing the voices in my ear, he can't help you, we're gonna kill you. And then I remembered that Sheila and, and Oz Guinness had said, Johanna, if you had believed on the true Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, you would not have had to face all of these horrendous experiences. You would have known the truth from the word of God. I hadn't a clue what they talked about then. But all of a sudden now I'm saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus of the Bible, Jesus of the Bible. I had thought they were the same ones. I had the wrong Jesus. But here comes the really scary part. I prayed with Os Guinness and Sheila several days after this confrontation, which I knew occurred over my potential decision to accept Jesus Christ of Nazareth as he says he is, instead of as I come to redefine him to suit my experiences, which is what's happening in the Christian world today. Oh, we'll talk about that tomorrow when I talk about how you test the spirits, because the first test is Jesus. Don't miss tomorrow night. Don't miss tomorrow. Because what you're being taught is helping you differentiate fleece from fur. I met with Oz and with Sheila and I prayed and I confessed my working with Pachita. But I didn't pray and confess all of my occult stuff. I didn't know to confess and renounce my occult psychic abilities that seemed to have come down from a great, great Aunt Dixie who predicted someone in my generation would inherit her power. I didn't know to get out of yoga and to stop practicing it. I didn't know to stop going back to silver mind control. But then I did know one thing, go back and read the word, go back and read the word. And I started to read the word. And all of a sudden I start finding Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not come. And I said, well, I confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Is that from God? And then a little voice said, maybe you've got the wrong Jesus, because gee golly, I stumbled across 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, 4, and 5, Paul's great negative confession. If the word faith people are right, the mess the church is in is Paul's fault. If you speak something negative and it goes out into the cosmos, that's what's going to come back to you? Well, then the mess the church is in is Paul's fault because he said, I'm afraid for you, little children, lest as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, which we have not preached, or a counterfeit, different spirit which you have not received, or a counterfeit gospel which you've not received. You nincompoops married beautifully. How is it? Because you were going by your experience. What? What do you mean another Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel? We're going to look at that more in depth tomorrow. But when I started, and you know what's really scary? 
When I went back to Mexico, more psychic than ever before, and suddenly finding out from the word, wait a minute, maybe I got the wrong Jesus, and I confront this Jesus that had suddenly so gone real quiet in my psychic lab. He was keeping a real low profile since I got back from Switzerland. And suddenly I call him and I bring him down and I say, Jesus, are you the Jesus of the Bible? Do you confess Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Are you the Jesus that died on the cross? Bam! It was like an atomic bomb fell and the whole, my whole place of silence that the New Apostolic Reformation and the contemplative meditators and Thomas Merton and Henry Nguyen and, and Beth Moore and etc. Et ad nauseum are sitting there working while they twist uh, Psalm 46.10 to mean something it doesn't mean. Gone, shattered, vanished. That place of silence was a demonic counterfeit to the peace that passes understanding as you look to the truth of the word of God. I was now an official Christian occultist before I suddenly tested this spirit and I had the imprimatur of Labrie to go with it like Sarah Bernhardt does. Well, I can't possibly be deceived. I got this Jesus experience at Labrie. I went to Labrie as war. I beg you, read Warren Smith's book, Another Jesus Calling. Read Ray Youngen's book, A Time of Departing. Read and watch Carol Matriciana's materials. These people are experts. They've done their homework. And mind you, they're paying a price for it. They're getting raked over the coals. Even recently, they'll talk about that if they, if they want to. But you have got to know. And I think I'm out, of, I'm out of time, aren't I, Pastor? He just went like this. Ooh, that's a dangerous thing to say to me. Okay, people, this, the pastor, I will wind this up and you can yank the lectern out from under me or I can take another few minutes and tell them what the Bible says about the occult super briefly, I promise. You tell me. Okay. All right, look, we've been talking about the occult and it is really not as complicated as it seems. The occult really, it's, let me, simple definition. It is the secret, dark, hidden, mysterious things, those things that go beyond the five senses, the supernatural phenomena studied by parapsychology, the mystical art of conforming reality to will, the science of mystical evolution. What on earth is that talking about? Who cares? It's as simple as Genesis chapter 3. Right? You all know Genesis chapter 3, right? I hope you do. Somebody nod yes. I know you've got a pastor who teaches you the word. You know Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than all the other beasts of the field. And he came and he said to Eve, point number one in the occult, indeed, has God said? The first point you'll see in the occult is a questioning the reliability, not only of who God is. Oh, God isn't really a he. We really need to address him as mother, father. Or maybe it's Ohm, like, like one of these neurosurgeons who had a near-death out-of-body experience says God is Ohm. Maybe he's an it or a she. Indeed, and furthermore, did he really say the word isn't that reliable? You don't really need to look at this. You ate the menu, dummy. You read it once, that's all you need, and you maybe don't even need to read it that way. If, as long as you're sincere, you have the rhema speaking to your soul. You don't need to test anything against this. Indeed, has God said. Point number one is questioning the authority of God and his word. And then Satan comes and he says, you surely shall not die. He comes right out from questioning the reliability of God and his word to flat out lying. There is no narrow-minded, Bible-thumping, bigoted, evangelical God. Rob Bell said so. Love wins. There is no place of eternal separation from God. Everybody gets to go to God. Everybody gets in. He's a jolly old, old, old treat dispenser in the sky. You put in your dime of sincerity and he will give you whatever you want. There is no judgment. There is no death. After all, little Colin Burpo went to heaven, and he's basically telling you there is no death. Mary Daly, a, a, an a orthopedic surgeon, dies in a, a rafting accident and is brought back to life, and she's talking about heaven, an evangelical, this waiting place where, where you get to make a final decision about whether you want to be with God, and basically everybody decides they want to go be with God. There is no place of judgment and separation, point two in the occult. For God knows that in the day you disobey him, in the day you stop trusting him and you eat of this fruit, you will be as God 
and your eyes shall be opened and you shall have knowledge and power. People, that's how complicated and how simple the occult is. And the Bible has a very clear perspective on it. Turn to Deuteronomy 18. In Deuteronomy 18, and there are dozens of passages we can look at. I know your pastor will be so relieved to hear. I'm not going to mention but one of them. When you enter the land, in Deuteronomy 18, beginning in verse 9 and following, when Moses is giving the people, the children of God, an overview about, the, about what they are expected to know as they're entering the promised land, he says this, when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, there shall not be found among you anyone who practices or imitates the detestable things of those nations. When you see the word detestable, the King James uses abominable, you sit up and you pay attention because he's telling you that this is something he really feels strongly about. What are the abominable practices of those nations? And in the day of the theocracy, by the way, when God was head of state, when he was king, when he was chief, when he got to lay down the rules of the land and say what was acceptable and what was high treason, what was worthy of honor and what was treachery against him, he decreed capital punishment against those who practice these abominable practices. We'll touch more on that tomorrow. He says, what are these abominable practices? There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. It was a hideous form of child sacrifice in which the people of the, of the pagan lands, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, the, the Hittites, the Hivites, the, all the other ites that were running around before the people of Israel were given that land by the living God, they practiced idol worship and the sacrifice of their infant children to demons. At Carthage, uh, archaeologists found a little cemetery that spanned 600 years of little urns with the, with the cremated remains of infants from newborn to four years old, which had been sacrificed. At least they had the good courage and sense to recognize this as a human being precious and keep it in a little urn, sometimes with a little toy, a little rattle that the mother had put in. And to the demon god, as the drums are pounding, they would take this child and place it in the, in the burning censer of Chemosh or Molach or Tanit. I suggest to you today, and by the way, I think we have in our audience one of the top experts on this subject, Dr. Greg Reed who understands the reality of Satanism and human sacrifice in this country today and has taught police departments across this nation and has also paid a high price for his stand on teaching about what's going on in some segments of society today. I suggest to you, while we may not be seeing child sacrifice to these demon gods and we may not be doing it necessarily in the church, let me suggest to you there's another form of child sacrifice to a more insidious God, the God promised to even Genesis 3, you shall be as God, you shall have knowledge and power. The God of the, of the, of the uh, Babylonians, I am, there is no other Isaiah 47, the God's self. And we don't even call them children. We call them blobs of tissue and wipe them from our lives by the millions. You think God will not judge a nation that engages in this. And how many of us, and it breaks my heart, and I do not say this in condemnation. I beg you, hear my heart and God's in this. Surely there are some, even sitting here, who have either had abortions or helped someone have an abortion. There is no sin so heinous that God will not forgive for those who come to him. But you need to understand the truth of the word of God and stop doing what so many Christians do, vote for people who are pro promoting and endorsing and demanding the right to do this. Okay, what is else is up in there with child sacrifice? Or one who practices divination, the mantic arts, astrology as a form of occultism, of divination, the Ouija board, the tarot cards, the palm reading, the I Ching that Carl Jung was so fond of. All of these are forms of seeking after the future apart from God using occult techniques. Or one who practices witchcraft, sorry, little Hermione of Harry Potter, the brightest witch of her age. Or one of the 10 million practicing pagans and witches in this country, probably at least that many. There's that many in the, in the Barnes and Nobles book selling thing, a growing number of people who ascribe to the tax exempt religion of Wicca and witchcraft. Or one who interprets omens. Oh my goodness, it's Friday the 13th and I saw a black hat. I'm not going to hear this crazy woman talk to us about this stuff. Or a sorcerer 
like Harry Potter, one who uses hal spells and hallucinogenic drugs to put themselves in an altered state of consciousness through which they can reach the same kinds of occult places if silence being taught to you in the New Apostolic Reformation, or one who casts a spell, or a medium that would make me sit up and take notice, or a spiritist for whoever, or one who calls up the dead, the necromancers, Benny Hinn, who lies on the graves of Catherine Kuhlman and Amy Semple McPherson, to absorb the energy and the anointing that rises up through their grave to touch on his spirit. No kidding. Perry Stone, who communicated with the spirit of a dear friend who was telling him he needed to go into ministry. It's the practice of necromancy here. For whoever does these things is abominable, to the Lord, and because of these abominable things, the Lord your God shall drive them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For those nations which the children of Israel dispossessed listened to those who practiced witchcraft and to diviners. But as for you, children of God, your Lord, your God has not allowed you to do so. And tomorrow, we're going to wrap up now because I am going too long. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about the practice of syncretism, which is how the occult which God has condemned has come into the church. God continually brought condemnation on the people of Israel for embracing the practices of the pagan nations and thinking they could honor God with that. Deuteronomy 12, when you enter the land, do not look at these people's gods and how they worship their gods and learn after them and think you're going to worship me that way. You shall not behave thus before the Lord your God. When the people in the New Apostolic Reformation, when the people in the Evangelical Church embrace techniques of mediumship, guided imagery visualization, shamanism, psychic abilities, which are all masquerading as gifts of the spirit, they have embraced techniques and practices that have their origins in the occult. We'll talk more about that tomorrow night. But people of God, look to his word and let's close with Isaiah 8 and when they say to you consult the mediums and the wizards who chirp and mutter should not a people consult their God should they consult the dead on behalf of the living to the law and the testimony if they do not speak according to this word it's because they have no dawn in them Father, seal the words that have been spoken tonight by Pastor Gary, by Carol, by myself, through the anointed worship of Chuck. Seal the words that are from you to our heart, Lord. And Lord, give us a hunger to test the spirits according to your word and to be a people pure and sanctified in the knowledge and truth of Jesus Christ and the simplicity and purity of devotion to him. In Jesus' name, amen.